but here we go. Yes, I'm going to try it, SegWit in one slide. So I'll say that there are a lot more details to this. So I'm going to, you know, give it like a high level view, but hopefully at the end of this slide, you'll understand if you don't already a little bit what SegWit is. Um, so in Bitcoin, we have blocks. So, so a block is really just, you know, it's got a header, which has like some, some, some cryptographic signature in it and, and so on. And then you have a bunch of transactions that make up that block. And if we zoom in on a transaction, um, a transaction consists of what are called inputs and outputs. And, and then altogether that has a transaction ID, which should be unique. Um, but but in, in the traditional one, I'll actually explain why it's not, necess not necessarily the case. <clears throat> so in the input, an input consists of two things. It consists of a unspent transaction output, which is, you know, you receive Bitcoins in the past. Um, so so the, these are the Bitcoins you received. And then a signature saying that, yes, I have the private key that matches that transaction that I'm allowed to spend it. And it has an output, which is where you're sending the Bitcoins. Uh, so it'll have, have an amount and it's going to have a, a public spending script. Um, there are really, you know, two main types of public spending spending scripts that that we care about. That there are there are more than this, but um, just for you know, these are the most common ones, um, and and these are usually a big, represented in a Bitcoin address, right? So you can pay to a script hash, uh, which is you know includes things like multisig, um, or or you can pay to a single public key hash, which is you know somebody's Bitcoin address that. You know, they have the private key, they generate the Bitcoin address, which they'll be able to spend later. Um, so what's different in SegWit? So a SegWit transaction is still inputs and outputs. And when you zoom in, something is going to be a little different here. So you still are spending an unspent transaction output, right? So you still have this, this UTXO. And then you have the same signature, right? So, you know, you receive the, the transaction in the normal way fr from a previous uh, uh, account, but here what's, here's what's different. So when you're sending this transaction now, you, sp you say the amount, but instead of a, of a public spending script, you have a set format for spending where there's a opcode, which is a version, which f for s the original SegWit is, is just op zero, right? So, so, so this is the version so, so it'll be version zero of SegWit, and then it has something called a witness program. So when a legacy uh, blockchain looks at this, all they see is, you know, you just have to take my word for this one, but it just looks like a, anybody can spend this. So, so this is a valid transaction. It looks like, you know, you saw somebody transact from, from someone to someone else. And, and to a legacy person, you think that you can spend that Bitcoin because it doesn't have a public key in it. But, but the soft fork actually does en enforce that that public key is spent through something called a witness. And so when you actually do want to spend that, being the one that, that is on the other side of that transaction, the receiver, uh, you know what your witness program is. So when you spend it, it looks interesting. So the input to that transaction doesn't have a signature. It just, you leave that empty and everything else. So here's another SegWit transaction. It's just gonna be again to the same kind of thing, version witness program, but you have attached to this transaction something that's the witness. The witness is actually just the public spending script that we had before, right? So, so it's basically the same as this, right? But it's, but it's taken outside of the transaction now. And, and that means that it's taken outside of this and it's taken outside of the block. It lets us do that. So a miner will still verify the witness before allowing that block to be mined. It, it's not actually an anyone can pay, but it means that we save a lot of space. We don't, we, we now have more than one megabyte block. The transaction ID actually doesn't include the witness. So the witness, remember, is the signature, okay? The witness is the signature that yes, I'm allowed to spend it. Once it's mined, you don't have to keep track of that anymore. It's been mined. It was verified by a miner that they were allowed to spend it. It's in there. We, we, we trust that it's okay. We don't need to include that in a transaction ID. And that's something that actually enables a practical lightning network. This was required to do that because there are tricks that you can do more than one signature that is valid for the exact same uh, public spending script and have two different transaction IDs and, and that it created transaction malleability which was actually one of the attacks that was used against Mt. Gox to take money out of them. 
um, you have other benefits. You actually have a smaller transaction size. So from, from two things, so you know, the typical SegWit transaction paid to uh, witness public key hash is smaller actually, because it has a, a smaller uh, transaction output size. But also when you go to spend that transaction, you're really getting ahead because you don't have to pay to include your signatures anymore in order to spend those transactions. And there's something, you know, I didn't talk about it really, but there's a version. So there's gonna be more than one SegWit version. So right now we have SegWit version zero is, is what's enabled on the blockchain. About 50% of transactions today are version zero. So that, that took about uh, three, uh, <coughs> I guess four years now, well, coming up to four years to get to 50%. Again, it's all voluntary. All the other 50% of the nodes, they're still running on the old versions. Um, so, so it was a soft upgrade, not mandatory, but about 50% have adopted using this. Version one is coming. Version one is called Taproot. And again, I'm gonna to try to do this in one slide. The full scope of this, I can't you know, talk about it all, but I'm really excited about Taproot and I'm gonna say a few words about it. And really a lot of the power of what uh, gives Taproot uh, it, its new feature capabilities is something called Schnorr signatures. Um, if, you, if you're not aware, uh, typical signatures in Bitcoin have been based on elliptic curve, 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 curve uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Schnorr is not the same. It's a different type of encryption scheme, um, but it makes something really easy to do. Um, it makes signature aggregation easy. So if you have, for example, what, if you want to create something where it's like a, a multi-key uh, payment, so, so you can have multiple public, private keys that are able to spend, you can aggregate those signatures into a single key and, and this is what it looks like. So, so these are Bitcoin addresses. Um, this is uh, a typical uh, SegWit uh, paid to witness uh, public key hash. This is what a uh, public witness script, script hash looks like. And a taproot transaction looks just the same. There's actually a small difference. Um, this is, uh, so it's called BEC32M, the, the format of, of the, of the uh, Bitcoin transaction. And it actually just fixes actually a, a bug that exists in, in uh, the current version, which is an innocuous bug. If I believe it's, if, the, if it ends with a P, you can insert as many Qs as you want and it passes the uh, checksum. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter for any applications, but hey, why not fix it? Uh, so, so this is what that looks like, okay? This, this, you, know, you generate this one public key. You no longer need to have a complex uh, you know, inclusion of each of these public keys. So in the old version of, of Bitcoin, you would need to include each of these public keys in the transaction output. Now you only need to include one. So you get savings there. And when you want to spend it, you see a signature, but you know, we don't know who signed it. All you know that it was valid. It was, it was valid and matched this. And you, and you just use one of these four, for example. Um, the real power though, it's going to come with something called MAST, Merkleized Abstract Syntax Trees. Don't worry about what that means, but here's what happens. So say you have four scripts, you can have, let's say 10,000 scripts. Each one of these scripts is a way to spend those Bitcoins. So, so script one, it could be like uh, two of three. Script two could be like date is greater than X. Script three, it could be like, you know, two plus two. What is the answer to that? Script four could be, you know, any, you know, a, a different set of keys. And, and so all of these scripts exist. And then you hash these scripts together to get a root hash. And you, and you have a, what, what is a master public key, which again could be formed from, from an aggregate of keys. And then that again is aggregated and you get one more, um, you know, uh, public key, a combined public key, which is the taproot output. Now, this, all this information, so all of this, you are not revealing, you're not putting it onto the blockchain. That is all hidden. Nobody needs to have that on the blockchain. It is all in there through cryptography in this single number, which is right here. Uh, and that is very cool. And then when you want to spend it, let's just say you spend script three. So you need to provide the answer. So let's, let's just say script three was that, what is, what is two plus two? If you can answer that, you get these Bitcoins. So if you answer that, you say, oh, it's four. All, you need to reveal that. And then you just need to reveal these uh, hashes in the blockchain. You never need to reveal one, two or four. So you don't even know what other ways there were to spend. Nobody will reveal that. 
and and you know you sign it and and you that's a valid signature with with, with this uh this taproot output um this is like super powerful because what it means is all these complicated scripts they look exactly the same as a pay to public key hash everything here just looks to the legacy clients it looks like a anyone can spend transaction but you have a lot of power here each of these transactions had a different size so so when you, when you have uh transactions with different sizes um you know i did i didn't really talk about it here right like you know you had like you know these segwit transactions were like 23 bytes 25 bytes 34 bytes like each one is a little different all of that is information that someone can use to track your transactions over time and so you lose that in taproot so you can have any type of transaction and they will all look the same and you can even obfuscate transactions in really complicated ways through through multisig and and this is just like to me this is mind blown like this is super cool this is super powerful it's going to enable all kinds of complex scripts that are very efficient uh and, and it's going to enable new features on lightning network um this is all coming and it's going to be activated this year like everyone there's no contention about getting this done it's implemented in bitcoin it's all about now activating and uh, the latest estimates i heard is that we should expect this by around november this year so so that's super cool and this is all soft fork right decentralized everyone agrees like this is good like this is how it should be this is how we should be able to move forward and upgrade without the need for centralization